Chapter 15 of Missing by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 15 The studio was empty. A wood fire burnt on the white hearth, making a pleasant glow in the wintry twilight. Cicely seated herself on the end of a sofa, crossed her feet, and took out a cigarette. But to Marsworth's intense relief, she had taken off the helmet like erection she called a hat and her black curly hair strayed as it pleased about her brow and eyes. "'Well?' she said at last, looking at him coolly. Marsworth could not help laughing. He brought a chair and placed it where he could see her from below, as he lay back in it, his hands behind his head. "'Of course you don't want to look at the portfolio,' she resumed. "'That was your excuse. You wanted to tell me of your engagement to Miss Stewart.' Marsworth laughed again. Her ear caught what seemed to be a note of triumph. "'Make haste, please,' she said, breathing quickly. "'There isn't much time.' His face changed. He sat up and held out his hand to her. "'Dear Cicely, I want you to do something for me.' But she put her own behind her back. "'Have you been quarrelling already? Because if you want me to make it up, that really isn't my vacation.' He was silent a moment, surveying her. Then he said quietly, "'I want you to help me.' I want you to be kind to that little girl. Daisy Stewart, thank you, but I've no gift at all for mothering babes. Besides, she'll now have all the advice and all the kindness she wants. Marsworth's lips twitched. Yes, that's true, if you and I can help her out, Cicely. Aren't you a great friend of Sir John Rain? He named one of the chiefs of the Army Medical Department, a man whose good word was the making of any aspirant in the field he ruled. Cissy looked rather darkly at her questioner. "'What do you mean?' "'I want you to help me get an appointment for somebody.' "'For whom?' "'For the man Daisy Stewart wants to marry.' Cicely could not conceal her start. "'I don't like being mystified,' she said coldly. Marsworth allowed his smile to show itself. "'I'm not trying to mystify you in the least. Daisy Stewart has been engaged for nearly a year to one of the house surgeons in your hospital. Young fellows.' Nobody knows it, not Willie even. It has been kept a dead secret, because that wicked old man, the rector, won't have it. Daisy makes him comfortable, and he won't give her up if he can help it. And as young fellow says nothing but his present pay, a year with board and lodging, it seemed hopeless. But now he's got his eye on something. And in a quiet, business-like voice, Marsworth put the case of the penniless one, his qualifications, his ambitions, and the particular post under the Army Medical Board on which he had set his hopes. If only somebody with influence would give him a leg up. Cicely interrupted. Does Willie know? No, you see, I've come to you first. How long have you known? Since my stay with them last autumn. I suspected something then, just as I was leaving, and Miss Daisy confessed, when I was there in May. Since then she seemed to have selected me her chief adviser, but of course I had no right to tell anybody anything. That is what you like, to advise people? Marsworth considered it. "'There was a time,' he said at last, in a different voice, "'when my advice used to be asked by someone else, and sometimes taken.' Cicely pretended to light another cigarette, but her slim fingers shook a little. "'And now you never give it?' "'Oh, yes, I do,' he said with sudden bitterness, "'even unasked. I'm always the same old bore.' There was silence. His right hand stole towards her left, that was lying limply over her knee. Cicely's eyes, looking down, were occupied with his disabled arm, which, although much improved, was still glad to slip into its sling whenever it was not actively wanted. But just as he was capturing her, Cicely sprang up. "'I must go and see about Sir John Rain.' "'Cicely, I don't care a brass farthing about Sir John Rain.' "'But having once brought him in, I recommend you to stick to him,' said Cicely, with teasing eyes. And don't go advising young women. It's not good for the military. I'm going to take this business in hand. And he made for departure, but Marsworth got to the door first and put his back against it. Find me the turner, Cicely. A man who asks for a thing on false pretenses shouldn't have it. A silence. Then a meek voice said, Captain Marsworth, my brother, Sir William Farrell, will be requiring my services at tea. Marsworth moved aside, and she forward. But as she neared him, he caught her passionately in his arms, and kissed her. 
she released herself, crimson. "'Do I like being kissed?' she said in a low voice. "'Do I? Anyway, don't do it again. And if you dare to say a word yet, to anyone—' Her eyes threatened, but he saw in them revelations her pride could not check, and would have disobeyed her at once. But she was too quick for him. In a second she had opened the door, and was gone. During the rest of the afternoon her brother and Nelly watched Cicely's proceedings with stupefaction, only equalled by the bewilderment of Miss Daisy Stewart, for that young lady was promoted to the good graces of Sir William's formidable sister with a rapidity and completeness which only natural good manners and good sense could have enabled her to deal with, considering the icy exclusion to which she had been so long condemned. But as she possessed both, she took it very simply, always with the same serene light in her grey eyes. Marsworth said to himself presently that young fellow's chances were good, but in truth he hardly remembered anything about them, except that by the help of them he had kissed Cicely, and had yet to find out what that remarkable fact was to mean, either to himself or to her. She refused to let him take her back to the farm, and she only gave him a finger in farewell. Nor did she say a word of what had happened, even to Nelly. Nelly spent again a very wakeful night. Farrell had walked home with them, and she understood from him that, although he was going over early to Carton the following morning, he would be at the cottage again before many days were over. It seemed to her that in telling her so he had looked at her with eyes that seemed to implore her to trust him. And she, on hearing it, had been merely dumb and irresponsive, not forbidding or repellent, as she ought to have been. The courage to wound him to the quick, to leave him bereft, to go out into the desert herself, seemed to be more and more oozing away from her. Yet there, beside her bed, on the table which held her testament and the few books, almost all given her by W. F., to which she was wont to turn in her wakeful hours, was George's photograph in uniform. About three o'clock in the morning she lit her candle and lay looking at it, till suddenly she stretched out her hand for it, kissed it repeatedly, and putting it on her breast, clasped her hands over it, and so fell asleep. But before she fell asleep, she was puzzled by the sounds in Bridget's room next door. Bridget seems to be walking about, pacing up and down incessantly. Sometimes the steps would cease, only to begin again after a while with the same monotony. What could be the matter with Bridget? This vague worry about her sister entered into and heightened all Nelly's other troubles. Yet all the same, in the end, she fell asleep, and the westerly wind blowing over Weatherlam, and chasing wild flocks of grey rain-clouds before him, found no one awake in the cottage or the farm to listen to the concert he was making with the fells, but Bridget and Cicely. Bridget Cookson had indeed some cause for wakefulness. Locked away in the old work-box, where she kept the papers to which she attached importance, was a letter bearing the imprint O.A.S., which had been delivered to her on Sunday afternoon by the Grasmere Post of Mistress. It ran as follows. Dear Miss Cookson, I know, of course, that you are fully convinced the poor fellow we have here in charge has nothing to do with your brother-in-law. But as you saw him, and as the case may throw light on other cases of a similar nature, I thought I would just let you know that, owing apparently to the treatment we have been carrying out, there are some very interesting signs of returning consciousness since your visit, though nothing very definite as yet. He is terribly ill, and physically I see no chance for him. But I think he may be able to tell us who he is before the end in which case I will inform you, as you should now, or at any future time, feel the smallest misgiving as to your own verdict to the matter. This is very unlikely, I know, for I understand you were very decided. But still, as soon as we have definite information, if we get it, you may wish to inform poor Mrs. Sarratt of your journey here. I hope she's getting stronger. She did indeed look very frail when I saw her last. Yours very truly, Robert Housen. Since the receipt of that letter, Bridget's reflections had been more disagreeable than any she had yet grappled with. In Nelly's company, the awfulness of what she had done did sometimes smite home to her. Well, she had staked everything upon it, and the only possible course was to brazen it out. That George should die, and die quickly, without any return of memory or speech, was what she terribly and passionately desired. In all probability he would die quickly. He might even now be dead. She saw the thing perpetually as a race between his returning mind, if he still lived, and it was returning, and his ebbing strength. 
If she had lived in old Sicilian days, she would have made a waxen image like the Theocretian sorceress, put it by the fire, that as it wasted, so George might waste. As it was, she passed her time during the forty-eight hours after reading Hassan's letter in a silent and murderous concentration on one thought and wish, George Sarratt's speedy death. What a release indeed for everybody! If people would only tell the truth and not dress up their real feelings and interests in stale sentimentalisms. Farrell made happy at no very distant date. Nellie settled for life with a rich man who adored her. Her own future secured, with the very modest freedom and opportunity she craved. All this on the one side, futile tragedy and suffering on the other. Nonetheless, there were moments when, with a start, she realised what other people might think of her conduct. But after all, she could always plead it was a mistake, an honest mistake. Are there not constantly cases in the law courts which show how easy it is to fail in identifying the right person, or to persist in identifying the wrong one? During the days before Parrell returned, the two sisters were alone together. Bridget would gladly have gone away out of sight and hearing of Nelly, but she did not dare to leave the situation, above all the postman, unwatched. Meanwhile Nelly made repeated efforts to break down the new and inexplicable barrier which seemed to have arisen between herself and Bridget. Why would Bridget always sit alone in that chilly outside room, which even with a large fire seemed to Nelly uninhabitable? She tried to woo her sister by all the small devices in her power. "'Why won't you come and sit with me a bit, Bridget? I'm so dull all alone,' she would say, when, after luncheon or high tea, Bridget showed signs of immediately shutting herself up again. "'I can't. I must do some work. "'Do tell me what you're doing, Bridget.' "'Oh, you wouldn't understand.' "'Well, other people don't always think me a born idiot,' Nelly would say, not without resentment. "'I really could understand, Bridget, if you try. "'I haven't the time.' "'And you're killing yourself with so many hours of it. "'Why should you slave so? "'If you only would come and help me sometimes with the Red Cross work, "'I'd do any needlework for you that you wanted. "'You know I hate needlework.' "'You're not doing anything, not anything, for the war, Bridget,' Nelly would venture, wistfully, at last. "'There are plenty of people to do things for the war. I didn't want the war. Nobody asked my opinion.' Presently the door would shut, and Nelly would be left to watch the torrents of rain outside, and to endeavour by reading and drawing, by needlework, and the society of her small friend Tommy, whenever she could capture him, to get through the day. She pined for Hester, but Hester was doing welfare work in a munitions factory at Leeds, and could not be got at. So there she sat alone, brooding and planning, too timid to talk to Bridget of her own schemes, and in her piteous indecision longing guiltily for Farrell's return. Meanwhile she had written to several acquaintances who were doing VAD work in various voluntary hospitals to ask for information. Suddenly, after the rain, came frost and north wind, finally, snow. The beginning in the north of the fiercest winter Western Europe has known for many years. Over heights and dales alike spread the white leveller, melting by day in the valley bottoms, and filling up his wastage by renewed falls at night. Nelly ventured out sometimes to look at the high glories of Weatherlam and the pikes, under occasional gleams of sun. Bridget never put a foot out of doors, except when she went to the garden gate to look for the postman in the road, and take the letters from him. At last, one evening, when after a milder morning a bitter blast from the north springing up at dusk had once more sent gusts of snow scudding over the fells, Nenny's listening ear heard the well-known step at the gate. She sprang up with a start of joy. She had been so lonely, so imprisoned with her own sad thoughts. The coming of this kind, strong man, so faithful to his small friend, through all the stress of his busy and important life, made a sudden impression upon her which brought the tears to her eyes. She thought of Carton, of its splendid buildings, and the great hospital which now absorbed them. She seemed to see Farrell as the king of it all, the fame of his doing spreading every month over the north, and wiping out all that earlier conception of him as a dilettante and an idler of which he had heard from Hester. And yet, escaping from all that activity, that power, that constant interest and excitement, here he was, making use of his first spare hour to come through the snow and the dark, just to spend an hour with Nelly Sarratt, just to cheer her lonely little life. Nelly ran to the window and opened it. 
Is that really you? she called joyously, while the snow drifted against her face. Farrell, carrying a lantern, was nearing the porch. The light upon his face as he turned showed her his look of delight. I'm later than I meant, but the roads are awful. May I walk in? She ran down to meet him, then hung back rather shyly in the passage, while he took off his overcoat and shook the snow from his beard. "'Have you any visitors?' he asked, still dusting away the snow. "'Only Bridget. I asked Hester, but she couldn't come.' He came towards her along the narrow passage, to the spot where she stood tremulous on the lowest step of the stairs. A lamp burning on a table revealed her slight figure in black, the warm white of her throat and face, the grace of the bending head, and the brown hair wreathed about it. He saw her as an exquisite vision in a dim light and shade. But it was not that which broke down his self-control so much as the pathetic look in her dark eyes, the look of one who is glad, and yet shrinks from her own gladness, tragically conscious of her own weakness, and yet happy in it. It touched his heart so profoundly that whether the effect was pain or pleasure he could not have told. But as he reached the step, moved by an irresistible impulse, he held out his arms, and she melted into them. For one entrancing instant he held her close and warm upon his breast, while the world went by. But the next moment she had slipped away, and was sitting on the step, her face in her hands. He did not plead or excuse himself. He just stood by her, endeavouring to still and control his pulses. Till at last she looked up. The lamp showed her his face, and the passion in it terrified her for there had been no passion in her soft and sudden yielding, only the instinct of the child that is forsaken and wants comforting, that feels love close to it and cannot refuse it. "'There, you see,' she said desperately, "'you see, I must go.' "'No, it's I who must go, unless,' his voice sank almost to a whisper, "'Nelly, couldn't you marry me? You should never, never regret it.' She shook her head, and as she dropped her face again in her hands, he saw a shudder run through her. At the sight his natural impulse was to let passion have its way, to raise her in his arms again, and whisper to her there in the dark, as love inspired him, his cheek on hers. But he did not venture. He was well aware of something intangible and incalculable in Nelly that could not be driven. His fear of it held him in check. He knew that she was infinitely sorry for him and tender towards him. But he knew, too, that she was not in love with him. Only he would take his chance of that, if only she would marry him. "'Dear,' he said, stooping to her, and touching her dark curls with his hand, "'let's call in Hester. She's dreadfully wise. If you were with her, I should feel happy. I could wait. But it is when I see you so lonely here, and so sad, nobody to care for you, that I can't bear it.' Through the rush of the wind, the sound of someone crossing the yard behind the farm came to their ears. Nelly sprang to her feet and led the way upstairs. Farrell followed her, and as they moved, they heard Bridget open the back door and come in. The little sitting-room was bright with lamp and fire, and Farrell, perceiving that they were no longer to be alone, and momentarily expecting Bridget's entrance, put impatience aside and began to talk of his drive from Carton. The wind on double rays was appalling, and the lamps got so besnowed we had to be constantly clearing them. But directly we got down into the valley it mended, and I managed to stop at the post office and ask if there were any letters for you. There were two, and a telegram. What have I done with them? He began to search in his pockets, its wits meanwhile in such a whirl that it was difficult for him to realise what he was doing. At that point Bridget opened the door. He turned to shake hands with her, and then resumed his fumbling. "'I'm sure they did give them to me,' he said, in some concern. Two letters and a telegram.' "'A telegram?' said Bridget, suddenly, hurrying forward. "'It must be for me.' She peremptorily held out her hand, and as she did so, Nelly caught sight of her sister. Startled out of all other thoughts, she too made a step forward. What was wrong with Bridget? The tall, gaunt woman stood there livid, her eyes staring at Farrell, her hand unsteady as she thrust it towards him. "'Give me the telegram, please. I was expecting one,' she said, trying to speak as usual. Harold turned to her in surprise. 
"'But it wasn't for you, Miss Cookson. It was for Mrs. Sarratt. I saw the address quite plainly. Now, here they are. How stupid of me. What on earth made me put them in that pocket?' He drew out the letters and the telegram. Bridget said again, "'Give it to me, please. I know it's for me.' And she tried to snatch it. Farrell's face changed. He disliked Bridget Cookson heartily, mainly on Nelly's account, and her rude persistence nettled a temper accustomed to command. He quietly put her aside. "'When your sister has read it, Miss Cookson, she will no doubt let you see it. As it happens, the postmistress may be promised to give it to Mrs. Sarratt myself. She seemed interested. I don't know why.' Nelly took it. Farrell, who began to have some strange misgiving, stood between her and Bridget. Bridget made no further movement. Her eyes were fixed on Nelly. Nelly, bewildered by the little scene and by Bridget's extraordinary behaviour, tore open the brown envelope and read slowly. "'Please come at once. Have some news for you. Your sister will explain. Housen, base headquarters, France.' "'Housen?' said Nelly. Then the colour began to ebb from her face. "'Dr. Housen?' she repeated. "'What news? What does he mean? Oh!' The cry ran through the room. "'It's George! It's George! He's found! He's found!' She thrust the telegram piteously into Farrell's hands. He read it and turned to Bridget. "'What does Dr. Housen mean, Miss Cookson? Why does he refer Mrs. Sarratt to you?' For some seconds she could not make her pale lips reply. Finally she said, "'That's entirely my own affair, Sir William. I shall tell my sister, of course. But Nelly had better go at once, as Dr. Housen advises. I'll go and see to things.' She turned slowly away. Nelly ran forward and caught her. "'Oh, Bridget, don't go. You mustn't go. What news is it? Bridget, tell me. You couldn't You couldn't be so cruel not to tell me if you knew anything about George.' Bridget stood silent. "'Oh, what can I do? What can I do?' cried Nelly. Then her eyes fell on the letter still in her hand. She tore one open and read it with mingled cries of anguish and joy. Farrell dared not go near her. There seemed already a gulf between her and him. It, it, it's from Miss Eustace, she said, panting, as she looked up at last and handed the letter to him. It, it's George. He's alive. They've heard from France. He's asked for him, but, 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 but he's dying. Her head dropped forward a little. She caught at the back of a chair, nearly fainting. But when Farrell approached her, she put up a hand in protest. No, no, I'm all right. But, Bridget, Miss Eustace says you've actually seen him. You've been to France. When did you go? "'About three weeks ago,' said Bridget, after a moment's pause. Oh, "'Of course I know,' she threw back her head defiantly. "'You're all set on me. You're all blame me. "'But I suppose I may be mistaken like anybody else, mayn't I? "'I didn't think the man I saw was George. I didn't. "'And what was the good of disturbing your mind?' But as she told the lie, she told it so lamely and unconvincingly that neither of the other two believed it for a moment. Nelly stood up, tottering, but mistress of herself. She looked at Farrell. Sir William, can you take me to Windermere for the night train? I know when it goes, ten-twenty. I'll be ready by nine. She glanced at the clock, which was just nearing seven. Of course, said Farrell, taking up his hat. I'll go and see to the motor. But, he looked at her with entreaty, you can't go on this long journey alone. The words implied a bit of consciousness that his own escort was impossible. Nelly did not notice it. She only said impatiently, "'But of course I must go alone.' She stood silent, mastering the agony within, forcing herself to think and will. When the pause was over, she said quietly, "'I will be quite ready at nine, and then mechanically, "'It's very good of you.' He went away, passing Bridget, who stood with one foot on the fender, staring down into the fire. When the outer door had closed upon him, Nelly looked at her sister. She was trembling all over. "'Bridget, why did you do it?' The voice was low and full of horror. "'What do you mean? I made a mistake, that's all.' "'Bridget, you knew it was George. You couldn't be mistaken. Miss Eustace says, in the letter,' she pointed to it, "'they asked you about his hands. Do you remember how you used to mock at them?' as if one could remember after a year and a half. No, you couldn't forget, Bridget, a thing like that. I know you couldn't. 
and what made you do it? Did you think I'd forgotten, George? At that the tears streamed down her face, unheeded. She approached her sister piteously. Bridget, tell me what it looked like. Did you speak to him? Did you see his eyes open? Oh, my poor George, and I here never thinking of him. She broke off incoherently, twisting her hands. Miss Eusey says he was wounded in two places, and severely that she's afraid there's no hope. Did they say that to you, Bridget? And tell me, for heaven's sake, tell me. You'll make yourself ill, said Bridget harshly. You'd better lie down and let me pack for you. Nelly laughed out. As if I'd never let you do anything for me any more. No, that's done with. You've been so accustomed to manage me all these years. You thought you could manage me now. You thought you could let George die, and I should never know, and you'd make me marry William Farrell. Bridget, I hate you! She broke off, shivering, but resumed almost at once. I see it all. I think I see it all. And now it's all done for between you and me. If George dies, I shall never come back to live with you again. You'd better make plans, Bridget. It's over, for ever. You don't know what you're saying now, said Bridget coldly. Nelly did not hear her, for she was lost in a whirl of images and thoughts, and governed by them she went up to Bridget again, thrusting her small white face under her sister's eyes. What sort of a room was he in, Bridget? Who was nursing him? Are you sure he didn't know you? Did you call him by his name? Did you, did you make him understand? He knew nobody, said Bridget, drawing back against her will, before the fire in Nelly's wild eyes. He was in a very good room. There was a nurse sitting with him. Was he... was he very changed? Of course he was. If not, I should have known him. Nelly half smiled. Bridget could never have thought that soft mouth capable of so much scorn. But no words came. Then Nelly walked away to a drawer where she kept her accounts, her cheque-book, and any loose money she might be in possession of. She took out her cheque-book and some two or three pounds that lay there. "'If you want money, I can lend you some,' said Bridget, catching at the old note of guardianship. "'Thank you, but I shall not want it.' "'Nelly, don't be a fool,' said Bridget, stung at last into speech. "'Suppose all you think is true. I don't admit it, mind. But suppose it's true. How was I doing such a terrible wrong to you? In the eyes, I mean, of sensible people, in not disturbing your mind. Nobody expected that man I saw to, to know anybody again, or to live more than a few days.' even though I have been certain. And how could I be certain? Wasn't it reasonable to weigh one thing against another? You know very well it's charges to ignore what's been going on here. But she paused. Nelly, writing a letter, was not apparently concerned with anything Bridget had been saying. It did not seem to have reached her ears. A queer terror shot through Bridget, but she dismissed it, as if Nelly could ever really get on without her little feckless, sentimental thing. Nelly finished her letter and put it up. "'I have written to Sir William's agent, Bridget,' she said, turning towards her sister, "'to say that I give up the farm. I shall pay the servant. Hester will look after my things and send them, when I want them.' "'Why Hester?' said Bridget, with something of a sneer. Nelly did not answer. She put up her letter, took the money and the cheque-book, and went out of the room. Bridget heard her call their one servant, Mrs. Dowson and presently steps ascended the stairs, and Nelly's door shut. The sound of the shutting door roused in her again that avenging terror. Her first impulse was to go and force herself into Nelly's room, so as to manage and pack for her as usual. But something stopped her. She consoled herself by going down to the kitchen to look after the supper. Nelly, of course, must have some food before her night's journey. Behind that shut door, Nelly was looking into the kind, weather-beaten face of Mrs. Dowson. "'Mrs. Dowson, I'm going away tonight, and I'm not coming back. Sir William knows.' Then she caught the woman's gnarled hands, and her own features began to work. "'Mrs. Dowson, they've found my husband. Did Sir William tell you? He's not dead. He's alive, but he's very, very ill.' "'Oh, you poor lamb!' cried Mrs. Dowson. "'No, Sir William told me now. The Lord be gracious to you.' Bathed in sudden tears, she kissed one of the hands that held hers, pouring out incoherent words of hope. But Nelly did not cry, and presently she said firmly, "'Now, please, you must help me to pack. Sir William will be here at nine. 
Presently all was ready. Nellie had hunted out an old grey travelling dress in which George had often seen her, and a grey hat with a veil. She hastily put all her black clothes aside. "'Miss Martin will send me anything I want. I've asked her to come and fetch my things.' "'But Miss Cookson will be seen to that,' said Mrs. Dyson wonderingly. Nellie made no reply. She locked her little box, and then stood upright, looking round the small room. She seemed to be saying good-bye for ever to the Nellie who had lived and dreamed and prayed there. She was going to George. That was all she knew. Downstairs, Bridget was standing at the door of the little dining room. "'I'll put out some cold meat for you,' she said stiffly. "'You won't get anything for a long time.' Nellie acquiesced. She drank some tea and ate as much as she could. Neither she nor Bridget spoke, till Bridget, who was at the window looking out into the snow, turned round to say, "'Here's the motor.' Nellie rose and tied her veil on closely. Mrs. Dowson brought her a thick coat which had been part of her trousseau, and wrapped her in it. "'You'd better take your grey shawl,' said Bridget. "'I've it here, miss,' said Mrs. Dowson, producing it. "'I'll put it over in the motor.' She disappeared to open the door to Sir William's knock. Nellie turned to her sister. "'Good-bye, Bridget.' Bridget flamed out. "'And you don't mean to write to me? You mean to carry out this absurd plan of separation?' "'I don't know what I shall do till I have seen George,' said Nellie steadily. "'He'll settle for me. Only you and I are not sisters any more.' Bridget shrugged her shoulders with some angry remark about theatrical nonsense. Nellie went out into the passage, threw her arms about Mrs. Dowson's neck for a moment, and then hurried out towards the car. It stood there in the falling snow, its bright lights blazing on the bit of Westmoreland wall opposite, and the overhanging oaks still heavy with dead leaf. Farrell was standing at the door, holding a fur rug. He and Mrs. Dowson tucked it in round Nellie's small, cloaked figure. Then, without a word, Farrell shut the door of the car and took the seat beside the driver. In another minute, Bridget was watching the lights of the lamps rushing along the sides of the lane, till at a sharp bend of the road it disappeared. There was a break presently in the snowfall, and as they reached the shores of Windermere, Nellie was aware of struggling gleams of moonlight on steely water. The anguish in her soul almost resented the break in the darkness. She was going to George, but George was dying. And while he had been lying there in his lonely suffering, she had been forgetting him and betraying him. The recollection of Farrell's embrace overwhelmed her with a crushing sense of guilt. George indeed should never know, but that made no difference to her own misery. The miles flew by. She began to think of her journey, to realise her helplessness and inexperience in the practical things of life. She must get her passport and some money. Who would advise her and tell her how to get to France under war conditions? Would she be allowed to go by the short sea passage? For that she knew a special permit was necessary. Could she get it at once, or would she be kept waiting in town? The notion of having to wait one unnecessary hour tortured her. Then her thoughts fastened on Miss Eustace of the inquiry office, who had written her the letter which had arrived simultaneously with Dr. Howson's telegram. Let me know if I can be of any use to you for your journey, for if there is anything you want to know that we can help you in, you had better come straight to this office. Yes, that she would do. But the train arrived in London at 7 a.m., and she could not possibly see Miss Eustace before 10 or 11. She must just sit in the waiting-room till it was time, and she must get some money. She had her cheque-book and would ask Sir William to tell her how to get a cheque cashed in London. She was ashamed of her own ignorance of these small practical matters. The motor stopped. Sir William jumped down, but before he came to open the door for her, he saw him turn round and wave his hand to two persons standing outside the station. They hurried towards the motor, and as Nellie stepped down from it, she felt herself grasped by eager hands. "'You poor darling! I thought we couldn't be in time, but we flew. Don't trouble about anything. We've done it all.' "'Cicely! And behind her, Marsworth!' Nellie drew back. "'Dear Cicely,' she said faintly, "'but I can manage. I can manage quite well.' Resistance, however, was useless. Marsworth and Cicely, it seemed, were going to London with her. Cicely probably to France, and Marsworth had already telegraphed about her passport. She would have gladly gone by herself, 
but she finally surrendered, for George's sake that she might get to him the quicker. Then everything was done for her. Amid the bustle of the departing train she was piteously aware of Farrell. Just before they started she leant out to give him her hand. "'I will tell George all you have done for me,' she said, gulping down a sob. He pressed her hand before releasing it, but said nothing. What was there to say? Meanwhile, Cicely, to ease the situation, was chattering hard, describing how Farrell had sent his chauffeur to Ambleside on a motor-bicycle, immediately after leaving Nelly, and so had got a telephone message through to Cicely. "'We had the small car out and ready in ten minutes, and by good luck there was a motor-transport man on leave who had come to see a brother in the hospital. We laid hands on him, and he drove us here. But it's a mercy we're not sitting on the rays. You remember that heap of stones on the top of the rays, that, that thing they say is a barrow, the grave of some old British party before the flood? Well, the motor gave out there. Herbert and the chauffeur sat in under it in the snow and worked at it. I thought the river was coming over the road, and that the wind would blow us all away. But it'll be all right for your crossing tomorrow. The storm would have quite gone down. Herbert thinks you'll start about twelve o'clock, and you'll be up the camp that same night. Oh, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it ripping? cried Cicely under her breath, stooping down to kiss Nelly, while the two men talked at the carriage window. You're going to get him home. I have the best men in London to look after him. He'll pull through, you see. He'll pull through. Nelly sank into a seat and closed her eyes. Cicely's talk, why did she call Marsworth Herbert, was almost unbearable to her. She knew through every vein that she was going across the Channel to see George die. If only she were in time, if only she might hold him in her arms once more. Would the train never go? Farrell, in spite of snow and storm, pushed his way back to Carton that night. In that long motor-drive a man could counsel with himself on whom the war had laid a chastening and refining hand. The human personality cannot spend itself on tasks of pity and service without taking the colour of them, without rising insensibly to the height of them. They may have been carelessly adopted or imposed from without, but the mere doing of them exalts. As the dyer's hand is subdued to what it works in, so the man that is always about some generous business for his fellow-men suffers thereby, insensibly, a change, which is part of the heavenly alchemy for ever alive in the world. It was so at any rate with William Farrell. The two years of his hospital work, hard, honest grappling with the problems of human pain and its relief, had made a far nobler man of him. So now, in this solitary hour, he looked his trouble courageously, chivalrously, in the face. The crash of all his immediate hopes was bitter indeed. What matter? Let him think only of those two poor things about to meet in France. As to the future, he was well aware of the emotional depths in Nelly's nature. George Sarratt's claims upon her life and memory would now be doubly strong. For with that long and intimate observation of the war which his hospital experience had brought him, Farrell was keenly aware of the merciful fact that the mere distance which, generally speaking, the war imposes between the man dying on the battlefield and those who love him at home inevitably breaks the blow. The nerves of the woman who loses her husband or her son are at least not tortured by the actual sight of his wounds and death. The suffering is spiritual, and the tender benumbing touch of religion or patriotism or the remaining affections of life has less to fight with than when the physical senses themselves are racked with acute memories of bodily wounds and bodily death. It is not that sorrow is less deep or memory less tenacious, but both are less ruinous to the person sorrowing. So at least Farrell had often seen it, among even the most loving and passionate of women. There is renaissance in the quiet Westmoreland life had been a fresh instance of it, he had good reason for thinking that, but for the tragic reappearance of George Sarratt, it would not have taken very long, a few months more perhaps, before she would have been dissuaded to let herself love and be loved again. But now, every fibre in her delicate being, physical and spiritual, would be racked by the sight of Sarratt's suffering and death. And no doubt, pure, scrupulous little soul, she would be tormented by the thought of what had just passed between herself and him before the news from France arrived. He might as well look that in the face. Well, patience and time. There was nothing else to look to. 
He braced himself to both as he sped homeward through the high snowy roads, and dropped through sleeping Keswick to Bassenthwaite and Carton. Then, with the sight of the hospital, the Red Cross flag drooping above its doorway as he drove up to it, the burden and interest of his great responsibilities returned upon him. He jumped out to say a few cheery words of thanks to his chauffeur, and went on with a rapid step to his office on the ground floor, where he found important letters and telegrams awaiting him. He dealt with them till far into the night. But the thought of Nellie never really left him, nor that haunting physical memory of her soft head upon his shoulder. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of Missing by Mary Augusta Ward This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 16 Of the weary hours which intervened between her meeting with Sicily and Marsworth at Windermere Station, and her sight of Dr. Howson on the rain-beaten quay at Boulogne, Nelly Sarrett could afterwards have given no clear account. Of all the strings that were pulled, and the exalted persons invoked, in order to place her as quickly as possible by the side of her dying husband, she knew practically nothing. Cicely and Marsworth, with Farrell to help them at the other end of a telegraph wire, did everything. Passports and special permits were available in a minimum of time. In the winter dawn at Euston Station there was the grey-headed Miss Eustace waiting, and two famous army doctors journeyed to Charing Cross a few hours later, on purpose to warn the wife of the condition in which she was likely to find her husband, and to give her kindly advice as to how she could help him most. The case had already made a sensation of the army medical headquarters. The reports on it from France were being eagerly followed, and when the young wife appeared from the north, her pathetic beauty quickened the general sympathy. Nelly's path to France was smoothed in every possible way. No royalty could have been more anxiously thought for. But she herself realised scarcely anything about it. It was her nature to be grateful, sweet, responsive, but her gratitude and her sweetness during these hours were automatic, unconscious. She was the spectator, so to speak, of a moving picture which carried her on with it, in which she was merely passive. The crowded boat, the grey misty sea, the destroyers to right and left, she was aware of them in one connection only, as part of the process by which she and George were to meet again. But at last the boat was alongside the quays of the French port, and through sheets of rain she saw the lights of a climbing town and the gleaming roadways of the docks. Crowds of men in khaki, a park of big guns, their wet nozzles glittering under the electric lamps overhead, hundreds of tethered horses, a long line of motor lorries. The scene to her was all a vague confusion, as Cicely, efficient and masterful as usual, made a way for them both along the deck of the steamer through close ranks of soldiers, a draught waiting their orders to disembark. Then, as they stepped on land, perception sharpened in a moment. A tall man in khaki, whom she recognised as Dr. Howson, came eagerly forward. "'Mrs. Sarrett, I hope you're not too tired. Would you rather get some food here in the town, or push on at once?' "'At once, please. How is he?' A pair of kind grey eyes looked down upon her sadly. Very ill, very ill, but quite sensible. I know you will be brave. He carried her along the quay, while Cicely was taken possession of by a nurse in uniform, who talked rapidly in an undertone. I have two cars, said Howson to Nelly. You and I will go first. Our head sister, Miss Parrish, who has been in charge of the case for so long, will bring Miss Farrell. And as they reached the two waiting motors, Nelly found her hand grasped by a comely elderly woman in a uniform of grey and red. "'He was quite comfortable when we left him, Mrs. Sarratt. There's a wonderful difference ever since yesterday, in his mind. He's beginning to remember everything. He knows you're coming. He said, "'Give her my dear love, and tell her I'm not going to have my supper till she comes. She shall give it to me.' "'Think of that. It's like a miracle. Three weeks ago he never spoke. He knew nobody.' Nellie's white face trembled, but she said nothing. Howson put her into the foremost car, and they were soon off, threading their way through the busy streets of the base, while the sister followed with Cicely. "'Oh, it was cruel not to let Mrs. Sarratt know earlier,' said the sister indignantly, in answer to a hurried question from Cicely as soon as they were alone. "'She might have had three weeks with him, 
and now there can only be a day or two. What was Miss Cookson about? Even if we were just mistaken, she might at least have brought her sister over to see for herself, instead of preventing it by every means in her power. A most extraordinary woman. Cicely felt her way in reply. She really knew nothing except what Farrell had been able hurriedly to say to Marsworth at Windermere Station, which had been afterwards handed on to her. Farrell himself was entirely mystified. "'The only motive I can suggest,' he had said to Marsworth, "'is that Miss Cookson had an insane dislike of her brother-in-law. But even so, why did she do it?' "'Why, indeed?' Cicely now heard the whole story from her companion, and her shrewd mind very soon began to guess at reasons. She had always observed Bridget's complacence towards her brother, and even towards herself, a clumsy complacence which had never appealed at all either to her or him. And she noticed many small traits and incidents that seemed to show that Bridget had resented her sister's marriage, and felt bitterly that Nelly might have done far better for herself. Also, that there was a strong taste for personal luxury in Bridget, which seemed entirely lacking in Nelly. She wanted Willie's money, thought Cicely and couldn't get it for herself. So when poor Sarrett disappeared, she saw a way of getting it through Nelly. Not a bad idea, if you are to have ideas of that kind. But then why behave like an idiot when Providence had done the thing for you? That was really the puzzle. George Sarrett was dying. Why not let poor Nelly have her last weeks with him in peace, and then, in time, marry her safely and lawfully to Willie? But Cicely had again some inkling of Bridget's probable reply. She had not been intimate with Nelly for more than a year without realising that she was one of those creatures, so rare in our modern world, who do in truth live and die by their affections. The disappearance of her husband had very nearly killed her. In the first winter, after he was finally reported as missing, believed killed, and when she had really abandoned hope, the slightest accident, a bad chill, an attack of childish illness, any further shock, might have slit the thin-spun life in a few days or weeks. The Torquay doctor had told Hester that she was on the brink of tuberculosis, and if she were exposed to infection would certainly develop it. Since then she had gained greatly in vitality and strength. If only fate had left her alone! With happiness at Willie she'd have been all right, thought Cicely, who was daily accustomed to watch the effect of mind or body in her brother's hospital. But now, with this fresh and deeper tragedy before her, tearing at the poor little heart, crushing the life again out of the frail being, why, the prospects of a happy ending were decidedly less. As to the history of Sarratt's long disappearance, Cicely found that very little was known. "'We don't question him,' said the sister. "'It only exhausts him, and it wouldn't be any good. He may tell his wife something more, of his own accord, but we doubt whether he knows much more than he told Dr. Housen. He remembers being wounded at Luce, lying out undiscovered, he thinks, for two days, then a German hospital, and a long, long journey. And that's practically all. But just lately, this week actually, Dr. Housen has got some information through a family of peasants living near Cassel, behind the British lines. They have relations across the Belgian border, and gradually they have discovered who the man was who came over the frontier with Mr. Serrett. He came from a farm somewhere between Brussels and Coutray, and now they've managed to get a letter through from his brother. You know the man himself was shot just as they reached the British lines. But this letter really tells a good deal. The brother says that they found Mr. Sarratt almost dead, and, as they thought, insane, in a wood near their house. He was then wearing the uniform of a British officer. They guessed he was an escaped prisoner, and they took him in and hid him. Then news filtered through to them of two English officers who made their escape from a hospital train somewhere southwest of Brussels, one slightly wounded and one severely the severely wounded man suffering also from shell-shock, and the slightly wounded man was shot, while the other escaped. The train, it was said, was lying in a siding at the time, at the further edge of the forest bordering their farm. So, of course, they identified the man discovered by them as the severely wounded officer. Mr. Sarratt must have somehow just struggled through to their side of the forest, where they found him. What happened then we, we can't exactly trace. He must have been there all the winter. He was deaf and dumb from nerve shock, and could give no account of himself at all. The men of the farm, two unmarried sons, were good to him, but their old mother, whose family was German, always hated his being there. She was in terror of the German military police who used to ride over the farm, 
and one day, when her sons were away, she took Mr. Sarratt's uniform, his identification disc, and all the personal belongings she could find, and either burned or buried them. The sons, who were patriotic Belgians, were, however, determined to protect him, and no doubt there may have been some idea of a reward if they could find his friends. But they were afraid of their tyrannical old mother, and of what she might do. So at last they made up their minds to try somehow and get him over the French frontier, which was not far off and through the German lines. One of the brothers, whose name was Benoît de Salle, to whom they say poor Mr. Sarrip was much attached, went with him. They must have had an awful time, walking by night and hiding by day. Mr. Sarrett's wounds must have been in a bad state, for they were only half healed when he escaped, and they had been neglected all the winter. So how he dragged himself the distance he did, the doctors can't imagine, and the peasants near the frontier, from whom we've got what information we have, have no knowledge at all of how he and his Belgian guide finally got through the German lines. But when they reached our lines, they were both, as Dr. Hauser wrote to Miss Cookson, in German uniforms. His people supposed that Benoit had stripped some German dead, and that in the confusion caused in the German line, at a point where it ran through a Belgian village, by a British raid at night, they got across the enemy trenches. And no doubt Benoit had local knowledge which helped. Then, in the no-man's land, between the lines, they were under both shell and rifle fire, till it was seen by our men that Benoit had his hands up, and that the other was wounded. The poor Belgian was dragging Mr. Sarratt, who was unconscious, and at last, wasn't it ill luck, just as our men were pulling them into the trench, Benoit was shot through the head by a German sniper. That at least is how we now reconstruct the story. As far as Mr. Sarratt is concerned, we let it alone. We have no heart to worry him. Poor fellow. Poor, gallant, patient fellow. And the sister's strong face softened, as Bridget had seen it soften at Sarrett's bedside. And there really is no hope for him? asked Cicely, after a time. The sister shook her head. The wounds have never healed, and they drain his life away. The card can't last out much longer. But he's not in pain now, thank God. It's just weakness. I assure you, everybody, almost, in this huge camp, Ask for him, and many pray for him. The sister's eyes filled with tears. And now that the poor wife's come in time, there'll be an excitement. I heard two men in one of our wards discussing it this morning. They do say as Mrs. Sarrett would be here today, said one of them. Well, that's a bit of all right, ain't it? said the other. And they both smoked away, looking as pleased as punch. You see, Miss Cookson's behaviour has made the whole thing so extraordinary. Cicely agreed. I suppose she thought it would all be over in a day or two, she said, half absently. The sister looked puzzled. And that it would be better not to risk the effect on his wife. Of course, Mrs. Sarratt does look dreadfully delicate. So you don't think it was a mistake? It's very difficult to see how it could be. The hands alone, one would think that anybody who really knew him must have recognised them. Cicely said no more, but she wondered how poor Nelly and her sister would ever find it possible to meet again. Meanwhile, in the car ahead, Howson was gently and tenderly preparing the mind of Nelly for her husband's state. He described to her also the first signs of Sarah's returning consciousness, the excitement upon her doctors and nurses, the anxious waiting for the first words, the first clear evidence of restored hearing. And then at last the day's question, Where am I? and the perplexed efforts to answer Howson's, Can you tell us your name and regiment? Hassan described the breathless waiting of himself and another doctor, and then the slow coming of the words, My name is George Sarratt, Lieutenant, 21st Lanchester's, but why? A look of bewilderment at nurses and doctors, and then again, sleep. The next time he spoke, it was quite distinctly and of his own accord. The nurse heard him saying softly, it was in the early morning, I want my wife, send for her. She told him that you had already been sent for, and he turned his head round at once, and went to sleep. Hassan could hardly go on, so keenly did he realise the presence of the woman beside him. The soft, fluttering breath unmanned him. But by degrees nearly heard all there was to know, especially the details of the rapid revival of hearing, speech, and memory, which had gone on through the preceding three days. "'And what is such a blessing?' said Hassan, with the cheerfulness of the good doctor, "'is that he seems to be quite peaceful.' quite at rest. He's not unhappy. 
he's just waiting for you, than have given him an ejection of strychnine this evening to help him through. How long? The words were just breathed into the darkness. A day or two, certainly. Perhaps a week, he said reluctantly. It's a question of strength. Sometimes it lasts much longer than we expect. He said nothing to her of her sister's visit. Instinctively he suspected some ugly meaning in that story, and Nelly asked no questions. Suddenly she was aware of lights in the darkness, and then of a great camp marked out in a pattern of electric lamps, stretching up and away over what seemed a wide and sloping hillside. Nelly put down the window to see. Is it here? No, a little further on. It seemed to her interminably further. The car rattled over the rough pavement of a town, then through the darkness of woods, threading its way through a confusion of pale roads, until, with a violent bump, it came to a stop. In the blackness of the November night, the chauffeur, mistaking the entrance to a house, had run up a back lane and into a sandbank. "'Do you hear the sea?' said Howson, as he helped Nelly to alight. "'There'll be wind to-night. But here we are.' She looked round her as they walked through a thin wood. To her right, beyond the bare trees, was a great building with a glass front. She could see lights within, the passing figures of nurses, rows of beds, and men in bed-jackets, high rooms frescoed in bright colours. That used to be the casino. Now it's a Red Cross hospital. There are always doctors there. So when we moved him away from the camp, we took this little house close to the hospital. The senior surgeon there can be often in and out. He's looking after him splendidly. A small room in a small house, built for summer lodgings by the sea. Bare wooden walls and floor, a stove, open windows through which came the slow boom of waves breaking on a sandy shore, a bed, and in it an emaciated figure propped up. Nelly, as the door closed behind her, broke into a run like the soft flight of a bird and fell on her knees beside the bed. She'd taken off her hat and cloak. Excitement had kindled two spots of red in her pale cheeks. The man in the bed turned his eyes towards her, and smiled. Nelly! Howson and the sister went on tiptoe through a side door into another room. Kiss me, Nelly. Nelly, trembling, put her soft lips to his. But as she did so, a chill anguish struck her, the first bitterness of the naked truth. As yet she had only seen it through a veil, darkly. Was this her George, this ghost, grey-haired, worn out, on the brink of the unknown? The old passionate pressure of the mouth gone, for ever? Her young husband, her young lover? She saw him far back in the past, on Rydal Lake, the dripping oars in his hands. This was a spirit which touched her, a spiritual love which shone upon her. And she had ever yet known so sharp an agony. So sharp it was that it dried all tears. She knelt there with his hands in hers, kissing them, and gazing at him. Nelly, it's hard luck. Darling, I'd better have been patient. In time, perhaps, I should have come back to you. How I got away, who planned it, I, I don't remember. I remember nothing of all that time. But Hazen has heard something through some people near Cassell. Has he told you? Yes, but don't try to remember. He smiled at her. How strange the old sweetness on these grey lips. Have you missed me dreadfully, poor little Nelly? You're very pale, the little shadow. Darling, I would like to live. And at that, at last, the eyes of both as they gazed at each other filled with tears. Tears for the eternal helplessness of man. The tears of things. But he roused himself, snatching still at a little love, a little brightness, before the dark. The strychnine injected had given him strength. Give me that jelly and the champagne. Feed me, Nelly. But have you had any food? The stress laid on the you, the tone of his voice, was so like his old self that Nelly caught her breath. A ray of mad hope stole in. She began to feed him, and as she did so, the sister, as though she had heard Sarrett's question, came quietly in with a tray on which was some food for Nelly, and put it down beside her. Then she disappeared again. With difficulty, Sarrett swallowed a few mouthfuls of jelly and champagne. Then his left hand, 
the right was helpless, made a faint but peremptory sign, and Lily immediately took some food under his dimly smiling eyes. I've thought of this so often, he murmured. I knew you'd come. It'd be like someone walking through a dark passage that was getting lighter. Only once I had a curious dream. I thought I saw Bridget. Nelly, trembling, took away his tray and her own, and then knelt down again beside him. She kissed his forehead, and tried to divert his thoughts by asking him if he was warm enough. His hands were very cold. Should he make up the fire? Ah, oh, no, it's all right. Wasn't it strange? Suddenly I seemed to be looking at her, quite close, and she at me. And I was worried because I'd seen her more distinctly than I could remember you. Come nearer, put your dear head against me. Oh, if I could only hold you as I used to. There was silence a little, but the wine had flushed him, and when the bloodless lids lifted again, there was more life in the eyes. Nelly, poor darling, have you been very lonely? Were the Farrells kind to you? Yes, George, very kind. They did everything, everything they could. Sir William promised me, he said gratefully. Where have you been all the time? At Rydal? No, I, I was ill after the news came. Poor Nelly. And Sir William lent us one of his farms near his cottage. Do you remember? A little. That was kind of him, very kind, Nelly. I, I want to send him a message. Yes? Give him my grateful thanks, darling. And, and my blessing. Nelly hid her face against him, and he felt the convulsion of tearless sobbing that passed through her. Poor Nelly, he said again, touching her hand tenderly. Then, after another pause, Sit there, darling, where I can see you, your dear head, and your eyes, and your pretty neck. You must go to bed soon, you know, but just a little while. Now tell me what you've been doing. Talk to me. I won't talk, I'll rest, but I shall hear. It's so wonderful that I can hear you. I've been living in such a queer world. No tongue, no ears, no mind, hardly. Only my eyes. She obeyed him by a great effort. She talked to him, of what she hardly knew. About her months in London and Torquay. About her illness, the farm, Hester Martin, and Sicily. When she came to speak of her friendship with Cicely, he smiled in surprise, his eyes still shut. That's jolly, dearest. You remember I didn't like her. She wasn't at all nice to you once. But thank her for me, please. She's here now, George. She brought me here. She wouldn't let me come alone. God bless her, he said under his breath. I'll see her tomorrow. Now go on talking. You won't mind if, if I go to sleep? They won't let you stop here, dear. You'll be upstairs. But you'll come early, won't you? They gave him morphia, and he went to sleep under her eyes. Then the night nurse came in, and the surgeon from the hospital opposite with Housen, and Cicely took Nelly away. Cicely had made everything ready in the little bare room upstairs, but when she had helped Nelly to undress, she did not linger. Knock on the wall if you want me. It's only wood. I shall hear directly. Nelly kissed her, and she went. For nothing in her tender service that day was Nelly more grateful to her. Then Nelly put out her light, and drawing up the blind, she sat for long, staring into the moonlight night. The rain had stopped, but the wind was high over the sea, which lay before her a tumbled mass of waves, not a hundred yards away. To her right was the casino, a subdued light shining through the blinds of its glass verandas, behind which she sometimes saw figures passing, nurses and doctors on their various errands. Were there men dying there tonight, like her George? The anguish that held her, poor child, was no simple sorrow. Never, she knew it doubly now, had she ceased to love her husband. She had told Farrell the truth. If George now were to come in at that door, there would be no other man in the world for me. And yet... While George was dying, and at the very moment that he was asking for her, she had been in Farrell's arms and yielding to his kisses. George would never know, but that only made her remorse the more torturing. She could never confess to him. That, indeed, was her misery. He would die, and her unfaith would stand between them 
for ever. A cleverer, a more experienced, a more practical woman, in such a case, would have found a hundred excuses and justifications for herself that never occurred to Nelly Sarrett, to this young, immature creature, in whom the passionate love of her marriage had roused feelings and emotions, which, when the man on whom they were spent was taken from her, was still the master-light of all her seeing, still so strong and absorbing that in her widowed state they were like blind forces searching unconsciously for some new support, some new thing to love. She had nearly died for love, and then, when her young strength revived, it had become plain that she could only live for love. Her hands had met the hands seeking hers inevitably, instinctively. To refuse, to stand aloof, to cause pain, that had been the torment, the impossibility for one who had learned so well how to give and to make happy. There was in it no sensual element, only Augustine's love of loving. Yet her stricken conscience told her that, in her moral indecision, if the situation had lasted much longer, she had not been able to make up her mind to marry Farrell quickly. She might easily have become his mistress, through sheer weakness, sheer dread of his suffering, sheer longing to be loved. Explanations and excuses for any more seasoned student of human nature emerged on every hand. Nelly, in her despair, allowed herself none of them. It merely seemed to her, in this night vigil, that she was unworthy to touch her George, to nurse him, to uphold him, utterly unworthy of all this reverent pity and affection that was being lavished upon her for his sake. She sat up most of the night, wrapped in her fur cloak, alive to any sound from the room below. At about four in the morning she stole down the stairs to listen at his door. There one of the nurses found her, and, moved with pity, brought her in. They settled her in an armchair near him, and then, with the tardy coming of the November day, she watched the sad waking that was so many hours nearer death, at that moment when man's life is at its wretchedness, and all the forces of the underworld seem to be let loose upon it. And there, for five days and nights, with the briefest possible intervals for food and the sleep of exhaustion, she sat beside him. She was dimly conscious of the people about her, of the boundless tenderness and skill that was poured out upon the poor sufferer at her side. She did everything for George that the nurses could show her how to do. It was the one grain of personal desire left in her, and doctors and nurses developed the most ingenious pity in devising things for her to do, and in letting every remedy that soothed his pain or cleared his mind go as far as possible through her hands. And there were moments when she would walk blindly along the sea-beach with Sicily, finding a stimulus to endure in the sharpness of the winter wind, or looking in vague wonder at the great distant camp, with its streets of hospitals, its long lines of huts, its training grounds, and the bodies of men at work upon them. Here the war came home to her, as a vast machine by which George, like millions of others, had been caught and crushed. She shuddered to think of it. At intervals Sarrett still spoke a good deal, though rarely after their third day together. He asked her once, "'Dear, did you ever send for my letter?' She paused a moment to think. "'You mean the letter you left for me, in case?' He made a sign of assent, and then smiled into the face bending over him. "'Read it again, darling. I mean it all now, as I did then.' She could only kiss him softly, without tears. After the first day, she never cried. On the last night of his life, when she thought that all speech was over, and that he would never hear his voice or see a conscious look again, he opened his eyes suddenly, and she heard, I love you, sweetheart, I love you, sweetheart, twice over. That was the last sound. Towards midnight, he died. Next morning, Cicely wrote to Farrell, We're coming home tomorrow, after they bury him in the cemetery here. Please get Hester, whatever she may be doing, to throw it up and come and meet us. She's the only person who can help Nelly now for a bit. Nelly pines for Rydal, where they were together. She would go to Hester's cottage. Tell Hester. Why, old boy, do such things happen? That's what I keep asking. Not being a saint like these dear nurses here, who really have been angelic. 
I am the only one who rebels. George Sarrant was so patient, so terribly patient. And Nelly is just crushed for the moment, though I sometimes expect to see a strange energy in her before long. But I keep knocking my head all day, and part of the night, a very small part of it that I'm not asleep, against the questions that everybody seems to have asked since the world began. And I know that I'm a fool, and go on doing it. George Sarrant, I think, was a simple Christian, and died like one. He seemed to like the chaplain, which was a comfort. How much any of that means to Nelly, I don't know. She also wrote to Marsworth. Meet us, please, at Charing Cross. I have no spirit to answer your last letters as they deserve. But I give you notice that I don't thrive on too sweet a diet. Praise is positively bad for me, wrinkles me up the wrong way. What can be done about that incredible sister? She ought to know that Nelly is determined not to see her. Just think, they might have had nearly a month together, and she cut it down to five days. Dear Herbert, say anything you like, and the sweeter the better. Yours, Cicely. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of Missing by Mary Augusta Ward This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers Chapter 17 "'Well, what news?' said Farrell abruptly, for Cicely had come into his library with a letter in her hand. The library was a fine eighteenth-century room still preserved intact amid the general appropriation of the big house by the hospital, and when he was not busy in his office it was his place of refuge. Cicely perched herself on the edge of his writing-table. "'Hester has brought her to Rydal, all right,' she said cheerfully. "'How is she?' "'As you might expect. But Hester says she talks of nothing but going to work. She's absolutely set her heart upon it, and there is no moving her.' "'It is, of course, an absurdity,' said Farrell, frowning. "'Absurdity or not, she means to do it, and Hester begs that nobody will try to persuade her against it. She has promised Hester to stay with her for three weeks, and then she has already made her arrangements. "'What is she going to do?' "'She's going to a hospital near Manchester. They want a VAD housemaid.' Farrell rose impatiently, and, stretching out his hand for his pipe, began to pace the room, steeped evidently in disagreeable reflection. "'You know as well as I do,' he said at last, "'that she hasn't the physical strength for it. "'Well, then she'll break down, and we can put her to bed. "'But try she will, and I entirely approve of it,' said Cicely firmly. "'Hard physical work, till you drop, till you're so tired you must go to sleep. "'That's the only thing when you're as miserable as poor Nelly. You know it is, Will. Don't you remember that poor Mrs. Hennessy, whose son died here? Her letters to me afterwards used to be all about scrubbing. If she could scrub from morning till night, she could just get along. She scrubbed herself sane again. The bigger the floor, the better she liked it. When bedtime came, she just slept like a log, and at last she got all right. But it was touch and go when she left here. She was a powerfully built woman, said Farrell gloomily. Oh, well, it isn't always the strapping ones that come through. Anyway, old boy, I'm afraid you can't do anything to alter it. She looked at him a little askance. It was perfectly understood between them that Cicely was more or less acquainted with her brother's plight, and, since her engagement to Marsworth had been announced, it was astonishing how much more ready Farrell had been to confide in her, and she to be confided in. But for her few days in France, however, with Nelly Sarratt, Marsworth might still have had some wrestles to go through with Cicely. At the very moment when Farrell's telephone message arrived, imploring her to take charge of Nelly on her journey, Cicely was engaged in fresh quarrelling with her long-suffering lover. But the spectacle of Sarratt's death and Nelly's agony, together with her own quick divination of Nelly's inner mind, had worked profoundly on Cicely, and Marsworth had never shown himself a better fellow than in his complete sympathy with her and his eager pity for the Sarratts. I haven't the heart to tease him, Cicely had said candidly after her return to England. He's been so horribly nice to me. And the Petruchio, having once got the upper hand, the Catherine was, like her prototype, almost overdoing it. The corduroy trousers, Russian boots, the flame-coloured jersey actually arrived. Cicely looked at them wistfully and locked them up. As to the extravagances that still remained, in hats or skirts or head-dressing, were they to be any further reduced, Marsworth would probably himself implore her not to be so suddenly reasonable, for without him 
Sicily would be only half Sicily. But his sister's engagement, perhaps, had only made Farrell feel more sharply than ever the collapse of his own hopes. Three days after Sarratt's death, Nellie had written to him to give him George's dying message, and to thank him on her own account for all that he had done to help her journey. The letter was phrased as Nellie could not help phrasing anything she wrote. Cicely, to whom Nellie dumbly showed it, thought it sweet. But on Farrell's morbid state it struck like ice, and he had the greatest difficulty in writing a letter of sympathy, such as any common friend might send her, in return. Every word seemed to him either too strong or too weak. The poor Viking, indeed, had begun to look almost middle-aged, and Cicely, with a pang, had discovered or fancied some streaks of grey in the splendid red beard and curly hair. At the same time, her half-sarcastic sense perceived that he was far better provided than Nelly with the means of self-protection against his trouble. "'Men always are,' thought Cicely. "'They have so much more interesting things to do.' and she compared the now famous hospital with its constant scientific developments, the ever-changing and absorbing spectacle of the life within it, and Farrell's remarkable position amid its strenuous world, with poor Nelly's housemaiding. But Nelly was choosing the path that suited her own need, and in the spiritual world the humblest means may be the best. It was when she was cooking for her nuns that some of St. Teresa's divinest ecstasies came upon her. Not that there was any prospect of ecstasy for Nelly Sarratt, she seemed to herself to be engaged in a kind of surgery, the cutting or burning away of elements in herself that she had come to scorn. Hester, who was something of a saint herself, came near to understanding her. Cicely could only wonder. But Hester perceived with awe a fierceness in Nelly, a kind of cruelty towards herself, with which she knew well from a long experience of human beings that it was no use to argue. The little, loving, easy-going thing had discovered in her own gentleness of weakness the source of something despicable, that is, of her own failure to love George as steadfastly and truly as he had loved her. The whole memory of her marriage was poisoned for her by this bitter sense that a little more than a year after she had lost him, while he was actually still alive, and when the law even, let alone the highest standards of love, had not released her, she had begun to yield to the wooing of another man. Perhaps only chance— and all the difficult circumstances of her intimacy with Farrell had saved her from a shameful yielding, from dishonour, as well as a broken faith. What had brought it all about? she asked herself, and she asked it with a desperate will, determined to probe her own sin to the utmost. Soft living, was her own reply, moral and physical indolence. The pleasure of being petted and spoiled, the readiness to let others work for her and think for her, what people called her sweetness. She turned upon it with a burning hatred and contempt. She would scourge it out of herself, and then perhaps some day she would be able to think of George's last faint words with something else than remorseful anguish. Love you, sweetheart. I love you, sweetheart. During the three weeks, however, that she was with Hester, she was very silent. She clung to Hester without words, and with much less than her usual caressingness. She found, it was evident, a certain comfort in solitary walks, in the simple talk of Mrs. Tyson and Father Time, who came to see her and scolded her for her pale cheeks with a disrespectful vigour which brought actually a smile to her eyes. Tommy was brought over to see her, and she sat beside him while he lay on the floor drawing hoons and haggins at a great rate, a brimful of fresh adventures in dupe. But he was soon conscious that his old playfellow was not the listener she had been, and he presently stole away with a wistful look at her. One evening, early in December, Hester, coming in from marketing in Ambleside, found Nelly sitting by the fire, a book open on her knee, so absorbed in thought that she had not heard her friend's entrance. Yet her lips seemed to be moving. Hester came softly and knelt down beside her. "'Darling, I've been such a long time away.' Nelly drew a deep breath. "'Oh, no, I, I, I've been thinking.' Hester looked at the open book and saw that it was The Letters of St. Ignatius, a cheap copy belonging to a popular theological library she herself had lately bought. "'Did that interest you, Nelly?' she asked, wondering. "'Some of it,' said Nelly, flushing a little, and after a moment's hesitation she pointed to a passage under her hand. "'For I fear your love, lest it injure me, for it is easy to do what you will, but it is difficult for me to attain unto God, 
if you insist on sparing me. And suddenly Hester remembered that before going out she had entreated Nelly to give herself another fortnight's rest before going to Manchester. It would then be only six weeks since her husband's death. And if you break down, dear, she ventured, it won't only be trouble to you, but to them, meaning the hospital authorities. Whereupon, for the first time since her return, Nelly's eyes had filled with tears. But she made no reply, and Hester had gone away uneasy. Why will you be so hard on yourself? she murmured, taking the lovely childish face in her two hands and kissing it. Nelly gently released herself, and pointed again, mutely, to a passage further on, the famous passage in which the saint, already in the ecstasy of martyrdom, appeals again to the Christian church in Rome, whither he is bound, not to save him from the wild beasts of the arena. I entreat you, show not unto me an unseasonable love, through whom it is allowed me to attain unto God. I am the corn of God, let me be ground by the teeth of the wild beasts, that I may be found the pure bread of Christ. Pardon me in this. I know what is expedient for me. I am but now beginning to be a disciple. Nelly, dear, what do you mean? A faint little smile crossed Nelly's face. Oh, nothing. Only, she sighed again, it's so splendid, such a will, such a faith. No one thinks like that now. No one is willing to be the corn of God. Oh, yes, they are, said Hester passionately. There are thousands of men and women in this war who are willing to do everything, suffer everything for others, their country, their people at home. Well, then they're happy. And why hold anybody back? said Nelly with soft reproach. And letting her head drop on Hester's shoulder, she said slowly, Let me go, Hester dear, let me go. It's drudgery I want. Drudgery, she repeated with intensity. Something that I don't want to do, something that's against the grain, all day long. Then she laughed and roused herself. Not much likeness between me and St. Ignatius, is there? Hester considered her gravely. When people like you are wrestling all day and every day with something too hard for them, their strength gives way. They think they can do it, but they can't. My strength won't give way said Nelly, with quiet conviction. Then, after pausing a moment, she said with a strange ardour, I once heard a story, a true story, of a man who burnt his own hand off because it had struck his friend. He held it in a flame till there was only the burnt stump, and after that he forgave himself and could bear to live again. But whom have you struck, poor child? cried Hester. George, said Nelly, looking at her with bitterly shining eyes. Hester's arms enfolded her, and they talked far into the night. Before they separated, Hester had agreed that the date of Nelly's departure should be not postponed, but quickened. And during the few remaining days they were together, Hester could only notice with growing amazement the change in all the small ways and habits that had once characterised Nelly Sarratt, especially since her Torquay illness, the small invalidisms and self-indulgences, the dependence on a servant or on Bridget. Now the ascetic, penitential passion had come upon her, as it comes in different forms upon many a man or woman in the selva oscura of their life, and Hester knew that there was no resisting it. Hester went back to her welfare work. Cicely travelled between Carton and London, collecting her trousseau and declaring that she would be married in Lent, whatever people might say. Farrell was deeply engaged in introducing a new antiseptic treatment of an extremely costly kind throughout his hospital, in watching the results of it, and in giving facilities for the study of it to the authorities and officials of all kinds who applied to him. A sorrowful man, but a very busy one. Marsworth was making his mark in the intelligence department of the War Office, and was being freely named as the head of an important military mission to one of the Allied headquarters. What would become of Sicily and the wedding, if the posts were given him, and, as was probable at a day's warning, was not quite clear. Cicely, however, took it calmly. They can't give us less than three hours' notice, and if it's after two o'clock we can always get married somehow by five. You scurry round, pay fifty pounds, and somebody at Lambeth does it. Then I should see him safely off in the evening. Meanwhile, Bridget Cookson was living in her usual Bloomsbury boarding-house, holding herself quite aloof from the idle ways of its inmates, who in the midst of the World War were still shopping as usual in the mornings, and spending the afternoons in tea and gossip. 
Bridget, however, was scarcely employing her own time to any greater profit for a burdened country. She was learning various languages and attending a number of miscellaneous lectures. Her time was fairly full, and she lived in an illusion of multifarious knowledge which flattered her vanity. She was certainly far cleverer and better educated than the other women of her boarding-house, and she was one of those persons who throughout life prefer to live with their inferiors. The only remedy against her superiority, says some French writer, is to love it. But Bridget was so made that she could not love it. She could only pull it down and belittle it. But all the same, Bridget Cookson was no monster, though she was probably without feelings and instincts that most people possess. She missed Nellie a good deal, more than Nellie herself would have believed, and she thought now that she had behaved like a fool in not recognising Sarah at once, and so preserving her influence with her sister. Morally, however, she saw no great harm in what she had done. It was arguable, at any rate. Everything was arguable. As to the effect on Nelly of the outward and visible facts of Sarat's death, it seemed to have been exactly what she, Bridget, had foreseen. Through some Manchester acquaintance she succeeded in getting occasional news of Nelly, who was, it appeared, killing herself with hard and disagreeable work. She heard also from the woman left in charge of the Lockrick farm that all Mrs. Sarratt's personal possessions had been sent to the care of Miss Martin, and that Sir William had shut up the cottage and never came there. Sometimes Bridget would grimly contrast this state of things with what might have happened had her stroke succeeded and had George died unrecognised. In that event, how many people would have been made happy who were now made miserable? The winter passed away the winter which seemed to sharpen for English hearts and nerves all the suffering of the war. On the Somme the Germans were secretly preparing the retreat which began with the spring, while the British armies were growing to their full stature month by month, and England was becoming slowly accustomed to the new and amazing consciousness of herself as a great military power. And meanwhile death in the trenches still took its steady toll of our best and dearest. And at sea, while British sea power pressed home its stifling grasp on the life of Germany, the submarine made England anxious, but not afraid. March showed some pale gleams of spring, but April was one of the coldest and dreariest in the memory of living man. The old earth, in sympathy with the great struggle that was devastating and searing her, seemed to be withholding leaf and flower, and forbidding the sun to woo her. Till the very first days of May, then, with a great return upon herself, nature flew to work. The trees rushed into leaf, and never had there been such a glorious leafage. Everything was late, but everything was perfection. And nowhere was the spring loveliness more lovely than in Westmoreland. The gentle valleys of the lakes had been muffled in snow and scourged with hail. The winter furies had made their lairs in the higher fells, and rushed shrieking week after week through delicate and quiet scenes not made for them. The six months from November to May had been for the Dale-dwellers one long endurance. But in one May week all was forgotten and atoned for. Beauty and hourly presence reigned without a rival. From the purple heights that stand above Langdale and Durban water, to the little ferns and mountain plants that crept on every wall or dipped in every brook, the mountain land was all alive and joyful. The streams alone made a chorus for the gods. Hester, who was now a woman of sixty, had reluctantly admitted, by the middle of the month, that after a long winter spent in a munition factory and a Lancashire town, employed on the most strenuous work that she, an honest worker all her life, had ever known, a fortnight's holiday was reasonable. And she wrote to Nelly Sarratt, just as she was departing northwards, to say, cunningly, that she was very tired and run down, and would Nelly come and look after her for a little. It was the first kindness she had ever asked of Nelly, to whom she had done so many. Nelly telegraphed in reply that in two days she would be at Rydal. Esther spent the two days in an expectation half eager, half anxious. It had been agreed between them that in their correspondence that the subject of Nelly's health was to be tabooed. In case of a serious breakdown, the commandant of Nelly's hospital would write. Otherwise there were to be no inquiries and no sympathy. Cicely Marsworth, before her marriage in early March, had seen Nelly twice, and had reported, against the grain, that although most unbecomingly thin, 
the obstinate little creature said she was well, and apparently was well. Everybody in the hospital, said Cicely, was at Nelly's feet. It is, of course, nonsense for her to lay down, that she won't be petted. Nature has settled that for her. However, I am bound to say it is the one thing that makes her angry, and the nurses are all amazed at what she's been able to stand. There's a half-blind boy, suffering from shock, in one of the wards, to whom they say she was devoted herself for months. She's taught him to speak again, and to walk, and the nerve specialist, who has been looking after the poor fellow, told her he would trust her with his worst cases, if only she would come and nurse for him. That did seem to please her. She flushed up a little when she told me. Otherwise she has become horribly impersonal. Her wings are growing rapidly. But, oh, Hester, I did and I do prefer the old Nelly to any angel I've ever known. If I hadn't married Herbert, I should like to spend all my time in tempting her, the poor darling, as the devil, who was such a fool, tempted St. Anthony. I know plenty of saints, but I know only one little, soft, kissable Nelly. She shan't be taken from us. So horribly impersonal, what did Cicely mean? Well, Cicely, with the object described in full view, would soon be able to tell her. For the Marsworths were coming to Hakarton for a week, before starting for Rome, and would certainly come over to her to say good-bye. As to William, would it really be necessary to leave him behind? Nelly must before long brace herself to see him again, as an ordinary friend. He had meant no harm, and done no harm, poor William. Hester was beginning secretly to be his warm partisan. Twenty-four hours later, Nelly arrived. As Hester received her from the coach, and walked with her arm round the tiny waist to the cottage by the bend of the river, where tea beside the sunflecked stream was set for the traveller, the older friend was at once startled and reassured. Reassured, because after these six months Nelly could laugh once more, and her step was once more firm and normal, and startled by the new and lonely independence she perceived in her frail visitor. Nelly was in black again, with a small black hat from which her widow's veil fell back over her shoulders. The veil, the lawn collar and cuffs, together with her childish slightness, and the curls on her temples and brow that she had tried in vain to straighten, made her look like a little girl masquerading. And yet, in truth, what struck her hostess was the sad maturity for which she seemed to have exchanged her old clinging ways. She spoke for the first time as one who was mistress of her own life and its issues, with a perfectly clear notion of what there was for her to do. She made up her mind, she told Hester, to take work offered her in one of the new special hospitals for nervous cases, which were the product of the war. They think I have a term for it, and they are going to train me. Isn't it kind and dear of them? But I am told it is the most exhausting form of nursing there is, said Hester, wondering. Are you quite sure you can stand it? Try me, said Nelly, with a strange brightness of look. Then, reaching out her hand, she slipped it contentedly into her friend's. Hester, isn't it strange what we imagine about ourselves, and what is really true? I thought the first weeks that I was in the hospital I must break down. I never dreamt that anybody could feel so tired, so deadly ill, and yet go on. And then one began, little by little, to get hardened. Of course, I'm only now beginning to feel that. And it seems like being born again with a quite new body that one can make, yes, make, do as one likes. That's what the soldiers told me about their training, and they wonder at it, as I do. My dear, you're horribly thin, interrupted Hester. Oh, not too thin, said Nelly complacently. Then she lifted up her eyes suddenly and saw the lake in a dazzle of light and silver how all purple as of old. Yet another family of wild ducks swimming where the river issued from the lake, and just beyond, the white corner of the house where she and George had spent their few days of bliss. Slowly, the eyes filled with brimming tears. She threw off her hat and veil, and slipping to the grass, she laid her head against her friend's knee, and there was a long silence. Hester broke it at last. I want you to come a little way up the fell and look at a daffodil field. We'll leave a message, and Cicely can follow us there. And then she added, not without trepidation, And I asked her to bring William, if he had time. Then he was silent a moment, and then said quietly, Thank you. I'm glad you did. They left the garden, and wandered through some rocky fields on the side of the fell, 
till they came to one where Linnaeus or any other pious soul might well have gone upon his knees for joy. Some loving hand had planted it with daffodils, the wild lent lily of the district, though not now very plentiful about the actual lakes. And the daffodils had come back rejoicing to their kingdom, and made it their own again. They ran in lines and floods, in troops and skirmishers, all through the silky grass and round the trunks of the old knotted oaks, that hung as though by one foot from the emerging rocks and screes. Above, the bloom of the wild cherries made a wavering screen of silver between the daffodils and the May sky. Amid the blossom, the golden green of the oaks struck a strong, riotous note. And far below, at their feet, the lake lay blue, with all the sky within it, and the softness of the larch woods on its banks. Nelly dropped into the grass among the daffodils. One could not have caught her the spirit of the spring, the gleeful, earthly spring, as it would have been natural to do in her honeymoon days. And yet, as Hester watched her, she seemed in her pale, changed beauty to be in some strange harmony with that grave, renewing, fruitful heart of all things, whereof the daffodils and the cherry blossom were but symbols. Presently there were voices beneath them, climbing voices that came nearer, of a man and a woman. Nelly's hand began to pluck restlessly at the grass beside her. Cicely emerged first, Cicely in white, very bridal and very happy, very conscious too, though she did not betray it by a movement or a look, of the significance of this first meeting since Sarratt's death between her brother and Nelly. But they met very simply. Nelly went a little way down the steep to meet them. She kissed Cicely and gave Farrell her hand. It was very good of you to come but then it seemed to Hester, who could not help watching it, that Nelly's face, as she stood there looking gravely at Farrell, showed a sudden trouble and agitation. It was gone very quickly, however, and she and he walked on together along a green path skirting the fells and winding through the daffodils and the hawthorns. Cicely and Hester followed, soon perceiving that the two ahead had slipped into animated conversation. "'What can it be about?' said Cicely in Hester's ear. "'I heard the word Sharkert, said Hester. "'The bride listened deliberately. "'And William's talking about an article in the Lancet "'he's been boring Herbert and me with, "'by that very specialist that Nellie's so keen about, "'the man that is going to have her trained to nurse his cases. "'Something about the new treatment of shock. "'I say, Hester, what an odd sort of fresh beginning.' "'Cicely turned a look, half grave, half laughing on her companion, "'adding hastily, the specialist married. Hester frowned a little. Beginning of what? Oh, I don't know, said Cicely with a shrug. But life is long, Mademoiselle Hester. Now they've got a common interest, outside themselves. They can talk about things, not feelings. Goodness, did you hear that? William is head over ears in his new antiseptic. Look at Nelly, she's quite pink. That's what I meant by her being horribly impersonal. She used the word scientific to me three times when we went to see her. Nelly! "'If she's impersonal, I should doubt whether William is,' said Hester dryly. "'Ah, no, poor Willie,' was Cicely's musing reply. "'It's a hard time for him. I don't believe she's ever out of his mind. Or at least she wouldn't be, if it weren't for his work. That's the blessed part for both of them. And now, you see, it gives them such a deal to talk about.' Her jester indicated the couple in front. "'It's like two sore surfaces, isn't it, that mustn't touch. You want something between.' "'All the same, William mustn't set his heart. "'And Hester, dear old thing, mustn't preach,' said Cicely, laughing and pinching her cousin's arm. "'What's the good of saying that about a man like William, who knows what he wants? "'Of course he set his heart, and will go on setting it. "'But he'll wait, as long as she likes. "'It'll be a long time. "'All right, and neither of them are Thuselers yet. "'Heavens, what are they at now? "'Ambreen? She's talking to him.' But some deep, mingled instinct at once of sympathy with Nelly and pity for Farrell, made Hester unwilling to discuss the subject any more. George's death was too recent, peace and a happy future too remote. So she turned on Cicely. And please, what have you done with Herbert? I was promised a bridegroom. Business, said Cicely, sighing. We had hardly arrived for our week's leave when the wretched war office wired him to come back. He went this morning, and I wanted to go too, but... 
I am not to wreck it just now. Cicely blushed, and Hester, smiling, pressed her hand. Then you are not going to Rome? Certainly I am, but one has to give occasional sops to the domestic tyrant. They sauntered back to tea in Hester's garden by the river, and there the talk of her three guests was more equal and unfettered, more of a real interchange than Hester ever remembered it. Of old, Farrell had been the guardian and teacher, indoctrinating Nellie with his own views on art, reading to her from his favourite poets, or surrounding her in a hundred small matters with a playful and devoted homage. But now, in the long wrestle with her grief and remorse, she had thought as well as felt. She was as humble and simple as ever, but her companions realised that she was standing on her own feet. And this something new in her, which was nothing but a strengthened play of intelligence and will, had a curious effect on Farrell. It seemed to bring him out also, so that the nobler aspects of his life and the nobler proportions of his character showed themselves unconsciously. Hester, with anxious joy, guessed at the beginnings of a new moral relation, a true comradeship between himself and Nelly, such as there had never yet been, which might go far. It masked the depths in both of them, or rather it was a first bridge thrown over the chasm between them. What would come of it? Again she rebuked herself even for the question. But when the time for departure came, and Nelly took Cicely into the house to fetch the wraps which had been left there, Farrell drew his chair close to Hester's. She read agitation in his look. So she's actually going to take up this new nursing? She says she is to have six months' training. Yes, don't grudge it her. Farrell was silent a moment, then broke out. Did you ever see anything so small and transparent as her hands are? I was watching them as she sat there. But they're capable, laughed Hester. You should hear what her matron says of her. Farrell sighed. How much weight has she lost? Not more as yet than she can stand. There's an intense life in her, a spiritual life, that seems to keep her going. Hester, dear Hester, watch over her. He put out a hand and grasped his cousin's. Yes, you may trust me. Hester, do you believe there'll ever be any hope for me? It's unkind even to think of it yet, she said gravely. He drew himself up, recovering self-control. I know, I know. I hope I'm not quite a fool. And indeed it's better than I thought. She's not going to banish me altogether. When this new hospital's opened, and in a month or so, and she's settled there, she asked me to call upon her. She wants me to go into this man's treatment. There was a touch of comedy in the words, but the emotion in his face was painful to see. Good, said Hester, smiling. When the guests were gone, Nellie came slowly back to Hester from the garden gate. Her hands were loosely clasped before her, her eyes on the ground. When she reached Hester, she looked up, and Hester saw that her eyes were full of tears. "'You'll miss her very much,' she said sadly. "'Cicely? Yes, she's been a great deal more to him lately than she used to be.' Nelly stood silently looking out over the lake for a while. In her mind and Hester's there were thoughts which neither could express. Suddenly Nelly turned to Hester. Her voice sounded strained and quick. "'I never told you on my way here. I went to see Bridget.' Hester was taken by surprise. After a moment's silence she said, "'Has she ever repented, ever asked your forgiveness?' Nelly shook her head. "'But I think she would be sorry if she could. I shall go and see her sometimes, but she doesn't want me. She seems quite busy and satisfied.' Satisfied, said Hester indignantly. I mean with what she's doing, with her way of living. There was silence. But presently there was a stifled sob in the darkness, and Hester knew that Nellie was thinking of those irrecoverable weeks of which Bridget's cruelty had robbed her. Then presently bedtime came, and Hester saw her guest to her room. But a little while after, as she was standing by her own window, she heard the garden door open, and perceived a small figure slipping down over the lawn, a shadow among shadows, towards the path along the lake. And she guessed, of course, that Nelly had gone out to take a last look at the scene of her lost happiness before her departure on the morrow. Only twenty-two, with all her life before her, if she lived. Of course, 
The probability was that she would live and gradually forget, and in process of time marry William Farrell. But Hester could not be at all sure that the story would so work out. Supposing that the passion of philanthropy, or the passion of religion, fastened upon her, on the girlish nature that had proved itself with time to be of so much finer and rarer temper than those about her had ever suspected. Both passions are absorbing. Both tend to blunt in many women the natural instinct of the woman towards the man. Nellie had been an old-fashioned, simple girl, brought up in a backwater of life. Now she was being drawn into that world of the new woman, where are women policemen and women chauffeurs and military suffragists, and women in overalls and breeches, and many other strange types. The war has shown us, suddenly and marvellously, the adaptability of women. Would little Nelly, too, prove as plastic as the rest, and in the excitement of meeting new demands and reaching out to new powers, forget the old needs and sweetnesses? It might be so, but in our heart of hearts Hester did not believe it would be so. Meanwhile, Nelly was wandering through the May dusk along the lake. She walked through flowers. The scents of a rich earth were in the air. Daylight lingered, but a full and golden moon hung over Lochrig in the west, and the tranced water of the lake was marvellously giving back the beauty amid which it lay, form and colour and distance, and all the magic of the hour between day and night. There was no boat, alack, to take her to the island, but there it lay, dreaming on the silver water, with the great hawthorn in full flower showing white upon its rocky side. She made her way to the point nearest to the island, and there sat down on a stone at the water's edge. Opposite to her was the spot where she and George had drifted with the water on their last night together. If she shut her eyes she could see his sunburned face, blanched by the moonlight, his strong shoulders, his hands, which he kissed, lying on the oars and mingling with the vision was that other, of a grey, dying face, a torn and broken body. Her heart was full of intensest love and yearning, but the love was no longer a torment. She knew now that if she had been able to tell George everything, he would never have condemned her. He would only have opened his arms and comforted her. She was wrapped in a mystical sense of communion with him as she sat dreaming there, but in such a calm and exaltation of spirit that there was ample room besides her in her mind for the thought of William Farrell, her friend, her most faithful and chivalrous friend. She thought of Farrell's altered aspect, of the signs of a great task laid upon him, straining even his broad back, and then of his loneliness. Cicely was gone. His little friend was gone. What could she still do for him? It seemed to her that even while George stood spiritually beside her in this scene of their love, he was bidding her think kindly and gratefully of the man whom he had blessed in dying, the man who, in loving her, had meant him no harm. Her mind formed no precise image of the future. She was incapable, indeed, as yet, of forming any that would have disturbed that intimate life with George, which was the present fruit in her of remorseful love and pity. The spring shores of Rydal, the meadows steeping their flowery grasses in the water, the new leaf, the upcurling fern, breathed in her unconscious ear the message of rebirth. But she knew only that she was uplifted, strengthened, to endure and serve. End of chapter 17 End of Missing by Mary Augusta Ward